Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. We're going to take a look at this Stanford Research Model SR630, which is a 16-channel thermal couple monitor. And I bought this because our refrigerator kept failing, and different areas of the refrigerator were at different temperatures, and I was getting really frustrated conveying this problem to the people who were supposed to repair it. So I looked around to see what was the best way to capture a whole bunch of thermal couple points from inside at a you know, reasonable cost, and this one came up. Now, before you turn these on when you purchase them, make sure you open and take a look inside because these are from the same era of the dreaded capacitor leaks that destroy the bores and you don't want to cause more damage. So before we do that, we're going to have to take a look and see if it has the same problem and then see if we can repair it. And here's the inside of the unit with the top off. Actually, looks really great. It's in very good condition. It's really clean on the inside. We do have a backup battery in there. We have to take a look and see if that's still holding any charge. We have a lot of relays in the back. These are switching the thermocouple inputs which are behind this shield. This unit still has the shield on it which is nice, sometimes that gets lost. And uh, this I think has only one digitizer, one sampler. So you're going to have to switch between the different individual inputs. And there's of course some life limitations when those relays being switched quite often. Now all the voltage regulators are in the front and the capacitors are right there. Some of them are under that ribbon cable. And if I look carefully, I did unfortunately think I did see some leakage of these capacitors, so we might have some damage to the board. And the only way to know is to really remove these. And it was a good idea not to turn it on. I think it has a firmware version 2.03 on it. I don't know if that's the latest one or not, but we can take a look. So next is to further take it apart so we can get to those capacitors. Well, here we are, took the capacitors off, and there is a lot of damage underneath all the capacitors, as to be expected from these leaky capacitors. When, they're, when the instrument is running and it's leaking, it's even worse, because when the current is flowing through the traces, it uh, accelerates the fact that they degrade. But even when it's sitting around, this thing is extremely corrosive and has destroyed all and everything underneath. So we're going to clean it completely up and see how many of those traces have survived and if we can rebuild it. All right, so here we are after the repairs. There were a lot of broken traces, which all had to be figured out and replaced with a wire at the top because there was no way to fix those traces. They were really, really thin. Now, a trick here to do this is that most of these places are between via to via, so there's no through-hole component in that area. Now, what I do in those situations is, depending on the kind of via, now, most vias and PCBs, especially the old ones, are basically a hole where they plate the surrounding area. So if you actually take a drill and drill in the center of this, you're not drilling any metal and you preserve the, the wall, which hopefully is going through all the PCB, still maintaining the connection. So I just took some very, very fine drills, actually broke a couple of them, but here it is, and I just drilled through each individual via very carefully without getting rid of the wall plating. And that way you can push a cable through it and it's a lot uh, easier to solder that way, especially because on the other side of the board, the solder was still maintained and the quality was good. There was not so much of the oxidization and breaking down of the surface of the printed circuit board. So it's a trick that usually works, but you still have to trace everything out and there's no schematic for this. So I'm just basically doing it visually with x-ray as well as what I can see and hopefully these are correct. All right, here we go. I put some capacitors in here and these are a little bit larger than the original ones because they're all rated 50 volts. It's a little bit above what it used to be, but this is what I had on hand. And there are also smaller capacitors in the back. I had to change all of those as well, just to be on the safe side. This capacitor was actually okay. It tested very well, ESR and everything, so I just kept it, no reason to remove it. The battery in the back uh, is actually working, surprisingly. We can always change that later if it runs into that situation. So everything looks good. I'm just going to put it back together to a point where we can turn it on. Measure the power supplies that are supposed to come out as voltage regulators. I did lose one of the pads underneath one. I have to find it. It's one of those situations where it hits the ground. It does a quantum jump in a different dimension. I have no idea where it went. But we'll find it and put it back and then hopefully it will work again. Well, check it out. It actually turned back on. I measured the power supplies. They were fine. And it looks like the repair actually worked, which is very nice. Now, it boots on. We still have to test it, of course. And I can change all the channels. And there's pooch in the background doing his thing in the lab as usual. So I can change the channel and they're all open right now. So you don't see anything and you can go, you should go to up to 16, I think. There you go and it jumps back to one. And here you can change some of the parameters of what kind of thermocouple is connected, what units are measured. So whether it's scanning or not. And this is a type three and type three, I think in the manual says this is a K type. Now I do have some J type a thermocouple that I'm going to connect to it and let's set something really simple and see if it actually measures temperature correctly. So I'm going to try and measure this. It looks really messy. So let me tell you what's going on. So there's a Peltier cooler here in the middle between two of these heat sinks. A Peltier cooler is of course a thermoelectric pump. So by pushing current through it, you can move thermal energy from one side to the other. It's a solid state device that can move heat around. It's 
pretty kind of like magic actually and it is a uh, very inefficient essentially but it works very well especially in small dimensions it's very useful using all kind of lasers and uh, all kind of uh, term temperature control devices at miniaturized level i think i've talked about it before in other videos so we can power it from this and I put a thermocouple on one side and a thermocouple on the other side. And there's some thermal paste in the middle. I'm squeezing it together with this little gripper here. So that allows us to measure the temperature difference as well as the temperature on each of those plates using our new repaired thermocouple measurement device. Let's see how well this performs. So I'm going to go ahead and use my Roden Shores power strip over here. We're going to put 1.5 amps through the system. And I think I wired it up correctly. And I just briefly tested it. That's why it's a little bit above ambient. So that number one, that's port one, we expect that side to get hot, and port two, we expect it to get cold. Right now, the whole thing is sitting at the same temperature on both sides because this thing is fairly thermally conductive, so it comes to the same temperature very quickly. So it is going to also set to, let me see, there you go, that's thermocouple type J on board channels one and two. Looks good. So let's go ahead and turn it on, and this is, of course, measuring centigrade here, and let's see how cold we can get it. Here it goes. Ah, uh, look at it climb down. Amazing. It's almost like magic, like I said. So let's see the other side. The other side should be warming up a little bit. There it is. Now the heat sink on that side is larger. It's going to take a little bit longer for it and also dissipates more to the environment. Where are we? There we go. Let's see if we can break the zero degrees Celsius barrier here. Go in below into freezing. Uh, I think it's going to do it, no problem. Eventually, it's not going to be able to keep up and uh, it starts getting warmer because we don't have enough isolation. We can't take the heat away from the other side fast enough. Now look at that. I think we're going to do it. There it goes. There it is. Below zero degrees. What are we sitting on that side? It's warming up ever so slightly. It's going to hit it's going to get pretty warm pretty quickly. Very cool. Let's leave it for a little bit and see how cold it gets. So it got as cold as about minus five degrees Celsius and now it's going backwards, as I said, because it's going to reach the other side. It's going to get so hot that it cannot maintain the temperature difference. So it actually starts to suffer. So the side is now at 42, you know, 43 degrees. And this, is, this thing is not very efficient at all. Right now we're putting 3.2 watts into this entire system. Yeah, you can see it's climbing back up. So if I turn it off, it should very, very quickly come back to the same temperature on the other side, as you can see, which is equilibrium pretty quickly. And the other side, is also going to cool down. Yeah, I think it works. So it was a very quick experiment, but I think all the channels work. I tried it out, and I hope you enjoyed this. I have a lot of these little repairs around the lab that I do. I know you like to see them. That's why I decided to quickly record this one. I have a few others, so I'm just going to jump back onto those, and I'll see you in the comment section.